So Deuteronomy chapter 25, I'll begin by reading the whole chapter. If there be a controversy between men, and they come unto judgment, that the judges may judge them, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. And it shall be, if the wicked man be worthy to be beaten, that the judge shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten before his face, according to his fault, by a certain number. Forty stripes he may give him, and not exceed. Lest, if he should exceed, and beat him above these with many stripes, then thy brother should seem vile unto thee. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. If brethren dwell together, and one of them die, and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her, and take her to him to wife, and perform the duty of an husband unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. And if a man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face. And shall answer and say, So shall it be done unto that man and will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel the house of him that hath his shoe loose. When men strive together one with another, and the wife of one draweth near for to deliver her husband out of the hand of him that smiteth him, and putteth forth her hand, and taketh him by the secrets, then thou shalt cut off her hand. Thine eye shall not pity her. Thou shalt not have in thy bag diverse weights, a great and a small. Thou shalt not have in thine house diverse measures, a great and a small. But thou shalt have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure shalt thou have, that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. For all that do such things, and all that do unrighteously, are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Remember what Amalek did unto thee, by the way, when ye were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee, by the way, and smote the hindermost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God. Therefore it shall be, when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. So at the end of verse 16 it says, All that do unrighteously are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Also saying, those that do such things, what's listed here above, diverse weights and diverse measures and that sort of unjust measuring and weighing when dealing and trading. The title of the message is today, uh, Justify the Righteous, Condemn the Wicked. And what's highlighted here, I believe, in Deuteronomy chapter 25 is, is exactly that. Those that are righteous ought to be justified in that. And those that are wicked or unrighteous ought to be condemned in the same. Verse 1, it says, If there be a controversy between men, and they come unto judgment, that the judges may judge them. So these men had a controversy. They came forth to the judges, particularly to get judgment settled, that the judges would decide right and wrong, good and evil, who's correct and who is wrong, who is righteous and who is wicked. That was why they came. When that happens, judgment was supposed to be swift, and it was supposed to be according to the law. It says at the end of that verse, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. To justify means to specifically declare right whoever is right there's a public approval that takes place of the righteous when they go forth to judgment and in contrary there is a public disapproval or condemnation of the one that is the wicked in this public controversy that is called to judgment Condem condemnation means to 
punish, it means to vex, and give that public denouncement of that wicked person. I think the contrast is simply being made that there is one righteous and there is one wicked, and that's going to be clear. And the paths that they go on are going to be very different. One, public approval, and one, public rejection and disapproval when judgment was to take place. These things were to be very public, and as God often does in Deuteronomy, I believe that's so when judgment takes place, the public can see what happened, and they can see, oh, this was righteous and therefore was justified. And this was condemned, and therefore is the wicked in this scenario. And therefore the public could see, ah, right, and ah, wrong, the consequences of both, and would choose the right, because they saw these things done very publicly. Our court system tends to do things behind closed doors. It's a little bit differently, and therefore we don't often see that public display. Verse 2, another public display is highlighted, and it says, And it shall be... If the wicked man be worthy to be beaten, so in other words, what he was condemned in be something that is punishable by a public beating, by a public flogging, it ought to be exactly that, public. It says that the judge shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten before his face, according to his fault by a certain number. So there was a certain number of stripes to be doled out. We'll get into that in verse 3. But what I want to draw attention to there in verse 2 is it says, He shall cause him to lie down, yes, and to be beaten, look at those three words, before his face. And this is something that I disapprove of in regard to our public public law and our public courts is that when a judge hands down a punishment, he walks away and goes into his little judge room and then that's that. He never sees what happens to the criminal. Whether wicked or... Or, or no matter how wicked, essentially, if the crime is punishable by a stripe here or by whatever it is, the judge ought to see it. And why would that be? Well, so that the judge can look and judge whether that punishment was worthy of what took place. Because he actually sees the effect of this certain number of stripes on a man, on a, on a, on a person that was condemned as the wicked in this scenario. Verse 3 gives that certain number that was to apply when dealing out stripes. It says, 40 stripes he may give him and not exceed, lest if he should exceed and beat him above these with many stripes, then thy brother should seem vile unto thee. So 40 stripes was the maximum that was to be doled out and not to be exceeded. This is why many believe that Jesus suffered 39 stripes. And uh, that was not exceeded because that was a tradition among them because many stripes would be what goes beyond that. It was Jewish law here then that they would never exceed that. Lest, it says, thy brother should seem violent to thee. In other words, there would be a hatred toward thy brother. So it may also be possible, I didn't check this out, I'm just talking from the top of my head, that Jesus was beaten beyond that. It talks about, um, or we talk about historically that he had that cat of nine tails. In other words, it wasn't just the stripe that took place, but also many stripes because every one of those lashes would have several lashes associated with it. Not only would it cut him with the whipping, it would also cut him with the tearing that happened afterwards. But history only tells us that. We don't know exactly. But here again is what the Bible says of the judge. Yeah, go ahead and dole out stripes to him, but witness it happen. And only 40. You shall not exceed 40. That's the maximum you can dole out. I think what would have happened is a judge would have punished somebody for, let's say, theft or whatever the crime was that deserves stripes. And he would see, oh, 35 seems unreasonable. Next time I'm going to do 30. Because he would have witnessed what took place in that doling out of the punishment. The maximum was there to ensure that the punishment wasn't something that was cruel or unusual or would create a vile perspective in the eyes of the people towards that brother. Now in verse 4 it says this, and this is a famous chapter or a famous saying, and you can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and I'll just read it because we'll catch it again there. It says in verse 4 of Deuteronomy chapter 25, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. And that's pretty famous because in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, let me grab my 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it deals with that in particular. 1 Corinthians 9 and chapter, in verse 7, sorry, it says, Who goeth a warfare at any time at his own charges? So who goes to war and pays their own way? Have you ever seen that happen? Buys their own shoes, buys their own boots, buys their own guns and ammo, gets their own uniform ready. Who goes to warfare at their own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? So who goes out and lays out, um, and breaks up the dirt and, and removes the stones and draws the lines and plants the seed and puts all this labor into, into removing the weeds and all the, all the toil that goes into a vineyard and does not even partake of the fruit of their own labor? It says this, Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not the milk of the flock? In other words, who keeps a flock? and doesn't partake of the goodness that that flock creates? Well, a good answer would be the, the slave, in the last two anyways, going out to warfare. Uh, that I don't see anybody paying for their own charge and fighting a warfare in that manner. It says in verse 8, Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? And here's that verse that we just referred to. It says, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox, that treadeth out the corn. Okay? So there's that statement. Muzzling the ox that treadeth out the corn. You know what that means? You put something on the ox's mouth so that as it's treading the corn, it cannot eat of what it's treading through. Who does such a thing? Thou shalt not, God says. That's cruel. That's unusual. That's not right in judgment. It doesn't even make sense. That ox needs fuel to go, that ox is working and toiling and laboring in that thing, it ought to be able to have a little snack as it goes along the way and, and take some of what it is working into. But it says here, doth God take care for the oxen? So is God's command here specifically because he just loves the animals so much? Because he just loves oxen, wants to see them well fed, wants to see them have little snacks as they go about their work. Is that God's only reason for giving this command? Verse 10 explains further that that's not the case. It says, or, here's the question, saith he it altogether for our sake. So is God just putting out this command so that he can take care of ox? Or is he trying to teach us something in particular here? As we know in most cases, even through Deuteronomy as we've read through it, God's given us a, a face value truth, but there's always something deeper and spiritual that applies to even us today. It transcends the timing of the Israelites into now and gives us often New Testament teachings in Old Testament laws. It's an amazing thing. He saith it then for us and our sakes altogether. I believe that's what the Apostle Paul is saying here. For our sakes, of course he's saying that because he says, no doubt it is written. No doubt he said this for our sakes, that he that ploweth should plow in hope and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. In other words, when you're working, you ought to hope for the reward that comes for you. When you're plowing as an ox, you ought to do it with that same hope that, hey, you're going to get to eat of this, even as you're working, but after the fact, it's going to come to you. That oxen plows the corn, snacks on it as he goes because he's not muzzled, and then after the fact, he knows that he's going to have the same hope laid up for him because he's drawn it in. And men ought to have that same hope, being partaker of what you are threshing in. Verse 11, it says, and the Apostle Paul speaking of himself and the men that labored with him, if we have sown unto you, Corinthian church, if we have sown unto you, planted into you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? He's saying, if I have done this labor to spiritually teach you, to spiritually encourage you, to spiritually nourish you, Corinthian church, is it some great thing if I should reap something carnal from you? Like if I sow something, can I not have a snack or ought I be muzzled? Like the ox is commanded not to be. Is it, is it such a thing that I should sow unto you this good spiritual truth and just not hope to receive anything back. He talks earlier in this about how he, he has power to do all sorts of things, including getting a job and getting a wife, but he has chosen rather to labor in the word, to, in self-denial, give to the churches that he ministers to spiritual 
truths to edify, courage, exhort, and sustain them, is it some great thing if he should also reap something carnal from them? In other words, should Paul get paid as a, for what he does? Should he receive wages for what he does, food for what he does, support for what he does? Verse 12, it says, If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we the rather? In other words, if others have done a service unto you, if somebody mows your lawn and you pay them, they did a carnal work for you, you paid them carnally. <laughs> Nevertheless, we have not used that power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. He's saying, if others are paid as a result of doing work for you, you tip your server, you give wages to those that bring you your food, you give wages to those that labor in your vineyard, whatever it is, someone shovels your laneway here in Canada, if you're going to pay them, is it some great thing that those that give you something more important than some labor, give you something spiritual, is it some great thing that they should receive something back? This is what the Apostle Paul is high highlighting. But what the Apostle Paul did, he said, nevertheless, should the gospel of Christ be hindered, I haven't even used this power. The Apostle Paul is saying, hey, I didn't even get paid, but don't you think it's fit that I do? What Apostle Paul is saying is that there's nothing wrong with somebody laboring spiritually for somebody and hoping to receive something carnally. And this is what he is saying that he has chosen not to do for a time lest he should hinder the gospel of Christ. And I believe specifically towards this Corinthian church, which was carnal. <clears throat> he also did the same thing among the Thessalonians. He was proving a point by denying that they would give him any carnal things to support him, that he would go about and work his own work and labor his own labor and have his own tent-making job and do all sorts of things to provide for himself because he didn't want to be a hindrance to the gospel of Christ. But it would be totally fitting for him to not be muzzled as he treads out the corn and reap of the carnal things as he plows and sows and harvests spiritual things in the lives of these people. We can continue on in verse 13. It says, Know ye not, or do ye not know, rather, that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. So know ye not, again, in reviewing of those great spiritual truths of the Old Testament. Leviticus 6 talks about it. Numbers chapter 5 talks about it. Deuteronomy chapter 18 talks about it. Then this pointed verse, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth of the corn. All talk to this same truth that the ministers live of the things of the temple that they minister in. And those that wait at the altar or serve at the altar ought to be partakers of that same altar. Verse 14, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. In other words, those that are gospel preachers ought to be rewarded in carnal things as a result of their ministry that they have done. Now, of course, in 1 Timothy 5 talks about it. You don't have to go there. It talks about double honor going to those that labor in the word and in doctrine. Okay, <clears throat> Talking about taking care of the bishops. Talking about taking care of the elders that labor well and providing for them a salary, providing for them gifts, providing for them whatever is needed to maintain them and their families and to keep them laboring in the ministry. That's true. But what we should grab at here in particular is that even so, verse 14, the Lord hath ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And this is what I think is going to come to fruition in the last days when, and we're hearing about it. I mean, we're already hearing things coming up and, and on the horizon, and I'm, I'm hearing whispers in the states and people testifying and reporting that there's, there's coming mandates into workplaces that go against people's scriptural convictions, that go against people's um, beliefs, that go against their faith, and these things are being enforced onto people, and if you don't, part, if you don't do what the mandate is, you will not be permitted to work. And so I believe people more and more are going to become without jobs, without um, support for themselves, without these types of things. The day may come, and I believe the Bible definitely gives credence to that, is that 
Yeah, you'll have a mark that you won't be able to buy or sell, but you really think your job's going to let you into your place when, when that is initiated? No, you'll need the mark to go and buy and sell. They're already instituting these, these things, and whatever you believe about, about the vaccinations or not, it is definitely a gateway or a stepping stone to the mark of the beast system that we see in Revelation chapter 13, because when you get the vax, they'll give you this little card that says you've been vaccinated, and they're going to start checking for these things. Show us your papers, comrade. Show us that you have been that you have received that vaccination or received that w test or received whatever it is so that you may now enter into the place of work, enter into the grocery store or whatever it is. But here we have a glimmer of hope that God hath ordained that if you're laboring as an ox, you ought not be muzzled. So yes, in the realm of the church, the church ought to do their best that they can to care for the ministers, which labor at the temple, which labor and wait at the altar, of course. But here there's another practical um, teaching for us in verse 14, that God has also ordained that if you're preaching the gospel, you'll be cared for in the same way. So in the last days, that ought to be our thing. And I've already talked about this a few times, especially in the uh, Follow Me series, is that God will be caring for those that are laboring in the things of God, those that are living righteously, those that are trying to be a witness, those that are serving Him continually, even when things get very challenging. And God will certainly prepare opportunity for those to receive. Look, God has never, David said it, seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. He provides for them. And if we're living righteously, if we're preaching the gospel, God here is saying he will also provide that you can live of the gospel. And that's not just eternal life, of course, which is settled up in heaven. That's also in the context here talking about carnal things, talking about your shelter, talking about your food, talking about your money, if that is what you need. And we talked about a whole bunch of things a few weeks back that we can just trust God to count, to take care of, because the book of Acts is just full of those miracles of God caring for his own people that were involved in the labors that he intended for them to be. Now, you can go back to Deuteronomy. <clears throat> so there's our last day's application of this verse. Live of the gospel if you're laboring in the gospel. This then is a practical application that all Christians should grab hold of. It's not just the pastor, it's not just the bishops or the elders or the ones in charge that are going to be living of the gospel, I believe, in these last days. There's a special care for his own. Deuteronomy chapter 25, and in verse 5, we'll continue on. It says, If brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and shall take her to him to wife and perform the duty of an husband unto her. And, if, and it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. So here God found it very important that the, the man's lineage would be, would be cared for and continue. So he says that if a brother passes away, unexpectedly it's presumed, then the wife shall marry the next brother in line and that firstborn child shall essentially take on the namesake of the firstborn. He will take on the birthright of having the twofold inheritance. He will take over all of the things that were due had that brother lived and continued on in his marriage. Now it says also though that, that um, when that takes place, that she that beareth it shall be the one that cares for the child and there will be a succession in the name of the brother which is dead and that his name be not put out of Israel. That's the bottom line importance of this teaching. Verse 7 though begins to highlight just how important this is to God at this time. It says, And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders. So he's going to, she's going to rather, bring this controversy to judgment, just like we saw in the first few verses there. And she will say unto the elders, it says, My husband's brother refuses to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel, and will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of this city shall call him, and others bring that man into judgment, and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not 
to take her. So in other words, if he stands his guns before judgment, says, I do not want to marry this woman, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders, loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face, and shall answer and say, so shall it be done unto that man that will not raise up unto his brother's house. Raise up seed unto his brother's house here is what he's talking about. And his name shall be called in Israel the house of him that hath his shoe loose. In other words, for whatever reason, he didn't want to marry her, but the judgment was that he was condemned in the same. He became a byword. This is that one that had his shoe loose. This is that one that didn't want to raise up seed unto his brother and care for his brother's widowed wife properly as he ought to. He was to care for this widow. He was to take her as his own, and he was to properly um, basically have the, the, the relationship of marriage and preserve seed unto his brother, as was intended had the brother lived anyways. The judges judge him guilty. This, this whole um, episode takes place. The shoe is removed, the spit in the face, and then they pronounce him or condemn him in this thing as being wicked. Now, Again, some of these things can be a little confusing to us, especially in the day that the time that we live in. But in Ruth chapter four, in Ruth chapter four, we find <clears throat> to the right, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Okay, it's not too far away, and to the right, I always try to look for it further down in your Bible. <clears throat> But here it is, is an example of this a little while later taking place, but things changed up a little bit. So we just see a manner of former time playing out versus the law that we just read. So Ruth, chapter 4, again, we're in Deuteronomy. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, just a little book there before 1 Samuel. Verse 1, it says, Then went Boaz to the gate and sat him down there. And behold, the kinsmen of whom Boaz spake came by, and whom he said, Ho, such an one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. So he brought in the elders. Judgment's about to take place in a scenario. And he said unto the kinsmen, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was thy brother Elimelech. So Naomi's husband died. And here the kinsman is the rightful redeemer, as we saw the brother was in Deuteronomy chapter 25. In verse 4 it says, And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of the people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it besides thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. So the parcel of land, which was the inheritance of Elimelech, who passed away, therefore Naomi, a widow, owns this parcel of land, and the right is in the hands of the kinsman redeemer here to take it back to him. And he says, absolutely, I will redeem it. Verse 5, though, it says, Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy all, it also of Ruth, a Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. So, he was also then to take the daughter-in-law to, here, Naomi, Ruth, to wife at the same time. But here, verse 6, it says, And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself. So he was going to redeem the land, but now that there's a wife involved, he says, I cannot do this thing. I cannot redeem it for myself. Why? Lest I mar mine own inheritance. In other words, lest I put, lest, lest I, I, I mess things up in my own home. Perhaps he was already married. Perhaps that would have caused confusion. Perhaps that would have caused trouble for him. But he says then to Boaz, redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, verse 7, this was the manner in former time. Now we read in Deuteronomy chapter 25, it wasn't the manner in former time in Israel, but rather this was the law of God in the time of Israel. It says here, concerning redeeming and concerning changing, for to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor 
And this was a testimony in Israel. So we see it's a little bit different than what was commanded. It was the woman then, Ruth, that ought to have taken off the shoe of the kinsman redeemer, removed it from him, and then spat in his face before the judges, before this all takes place. But it looks like things have changed a little bit, and Israel is doing things a little bit differently their own way. But the same kind of steps are being played out here. They give it to the neighbor as a testimony. In verse 8 it says, Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe, and Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day, that I have bought all that was Elimelech's, and all that was Kylon's, and all that was Malon's, of the hand of Naomi. So he also then inherited Ruth, in verse 10, Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren, and from the gate of his presence ye are witnesses this day. And so I just wanted to show you that there's an example of that verse taking place. Go back and read through Ruth. It's a fantastic story with all sorts of parallels to Christ and, and how he redeemed us, um, being, being Gentiles and, and, and that sort of thing. You can read that in your own time. It's a great study. But what I do see here, though, is that the manner and form of time versus the law changed a little bit, but the bottom line in the end was that Boaz did what was right in that he took to him the wife of the deceased and raised up, his intent was to raise up the inheritance and the name of the dead in order to preserve it unto this day, essentially. He, he, he desired to do what was appropriate and right according to the word of God. <clears throat> now we can go back, if you would, to uh, Deuteronomy 25. <clears throat> and if we remember, the Sadducees actually brought up this statement in the New Testament when they were trying to attack Jesus. Because they didn't believe the resurrection, so they just kind of used this teaching here to, to mock the law, mock Christ, essentially. They, they, were, they were the sect that, you know, like we say, they, they were sad, sad, you see, the Sadducees, because they did not believe in the resurrection. Is a little joke there that you hear. They brought this to Christ, and they essentially said, well, there's this woman and man, the man died, and then his brother married her, and then his brother married her, and they kept dying. And now there were seven brothers that had taken her to wife, but there was no children. Now, now whose who's, uh, husband shall she, or whose wife shall she be in the resurrection they brought to Jesus? Because they were trying to cause confusion there. And Jesus just answered as he often does. He's like, well, in the, they're, they're not given in marriage in the resurrection, whereas the angels, which are in heaven, and he kind of squashed their, their dumb idea and then went on to preach about the resurrection further just to kind of, you know, twist the knife and, and just really rub it in these guys' face. But <clears throat> you see then what can happen in the example of the Sadducees when there's these laws that, that seem kind of confusing again to us. I keep bringing this up in Deuteronomy, and maybe I'll pray on it, and there will be more clarity that comes in a couple weeks. I'm hoping so. But that whole thing about removing the shoe from his foot, spitting in his face, and, and how his name is ruined. To me, right now, just on face value, that's just highlighting the importance of God that the inheritance go on, that there be a seed that is raised up, and that the, that widow is properly taken care of and isn't just le left, like, basically wanting. Because I believe back then, it's not like the woman could just, you know, put on a hat and go work in, in a factory. I mean, women were dependent rightly so upon their husbands just like you know women in, in the baptist circles are being being taught to to re relinquish and remove themselves from the workplace and care for the home and do the, the the proper duty of a of a woman to be the wife and to be the mother and to be the caretaker she's relying completely on the husband it would be a it would be a great and crying shame of a very frightening thing for my wife for example to lose me what would she do? What, how could she possibly care for the home and these two children w without me? And so you see that God's intent was that in this, he would provide for her. It's like his plan for, for basically keeping that woman cared for, keeping that inheritance raising up properly as it should be and, and doing right. This is, this is his righteous judgment in the matter. <clears throat> and again, Sadducees will come into our lives and mock this. But you know what? Just say, hey, I believe it. I may not understand exactly what's going on. I've taken practical learnings from it. I can share it with you. But you know what? Sad to see, you probably don't want to hear it anyway. So here, let me preach you the resurrection. That's how Christ dealt with these kind of mocking attacks that come upon the Word of God. I love the Word of God. It's perfect. It's right. It's just all the time, even if I don't 
fully understand it. But you do see then how dishonorable it was not to maintain the family line when you had the power to do so. Not to probably take for this widow when you had the power to do so. Publicly, this man was to have his shoe taken off, spit in his face, and have this name put upon him. That's the one that has his shoe loosed. He would be, he would be dis, you know, publicly shamed in, in, in this scenario. <clears throat> Continuing on in verse 11 there in Deuteronomy chapter 25. When men strive to gather one with another, and the wife of one draweth near for to deliver her husband out of the hand of him that smiteth him, and purteth forth her hand, and taketh him by the secrets, then thou shalt cut off her hand, and thine eyes shall not pity. So here's an example of, um, again, a, a righteous judgment showing the severity of what this woman did in that place, in that, in that opportunity. Two men are fighting, and she got involved in a way that she ought not have gotten involved. And her punishment was severe. But here, God, if he was to bring her into judgment, these judges would justify the righteous and would condemn the wicked. And this woman would be judged wicked in that case, and she would have that very horrible thing happen to her and have her hand removed at that time. I don't fully understand it. I don't think it's ever taken place. I've never seen that, that law enacted, but maybe it's just something that we can look at and learn from and take an example of um, <clears throat> basically the place of a woman with regard to defending the husband. I don't think there's anything wrong with a woman defending a husband, but here there's a fight that's taking place that had nothing to do with her, and she got involved by making low blows, essentially. So there's, there's something that was unrighteous in this scenario that ought not to have been done, and God takes it very seriously. Verse 13, Thou shalt not have in thy bag diverse weights, a great and a small. Thou shalt not have in thine house diverse measures, a great and a small. But thou shalt have perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure shalt thou have, that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. For all that do such things, and all that do unrighteously, are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. So we've heard this teaching before about having just weights and measures, not having a weight that's a little bit more or a little bit less in order so that you can charge more when it comes time to check out um, and give this guy a, a reasonable quantity and give this guy um, an unreasonable low, low quantity because you've changed the measure and the standard there. <clears throat> Everything ought to be just. And this is, goes along with having no respect of persons. You ought to judge this the same as that. You have to you have to have the same this this exact same basically judgment that ought to take place. So what should the standard be? Well, here God says a righteous and a perfect weight and a righteous and a perfect measure for us if we were to just look at our general lives, we could just look to the holy scriptures and make that our righteous measure. Make that our just weight and judge everything that goes on based upon that. When we apply the scriptures as our judgment in our lives, then we have that just weight, just measure. Everything is appropriate, right, and good. And the thing is, is when we take the word of God and we apply it to scenarios, we ought to not judge somebody based on the word of God differently on this side than we do on this side. Or how about this? I ought not to take the word of God and judge you differently than I would judge myself. That's me kind of putting less weight to something in the Word of God. No, everything ought to have the same weight when it's being applied to this Christian versus that Christian compared to this unbeliever versus that unbeliever. We ought to judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. That is the, what God is highlighting here in this chapter. He's highlighting this there in this book. The whole scriptures speak to the judgment and the righteous judgment of God Almighty God. And we ought to let Him be our standard. And the good thing about that is if we do let Him be the standard, the promise is made in verse 15, that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So here's another promise that if there's righteous judgment in a land, you will dwell long in the land. You will live well in the land. Your days may be prolonged in the land. You won't suffer from health. You won't suffer from famine issues. You won't suffer from warfares that come upon a nation that does unrighteously, as the next verse says in verse 16. It says, all that do such things, in other words, have unrighteousness and judgment, judge things unrighteously, or even more specifically, those that do unrighteously, those are abomination. Those are sickening to God. God can't stand unrighteous judgment in people that do unrighteously in judgment and in their way that they live their lives. So, 
please God by having faith and doing according to what the word of God says, and you'll be prolonged in this land. Another promise for you as days get tougher and things get harder and the world gets more difficult for place for Christians to live. You can have the promise of God that you will be cared for and dwell long in the land if you simply have righteousness and judgment and do according to what God says. Verse 17, we'll continue on. It says, remember, now here's a practical example. Whenever God does this, he teaches us a bunch of things, gives us a bunch of laws, and then he says, hey, remember this. We ought to take heed. I highlight that one in blue. Just here's some wisdom here. Remember this thing. What Amalek did unto thee by the way when you were come forth out of Egypt. So one thing I've started to try to teach Caleb is we don't have to learn from our own mistakes. In other words, we don't have to touch the hot pan in order to know that it is hot. All we need to do is hear from somebody else who has touched the hot pan, and now they know, and, and now someone else can learn from someone else's mistakes. And this is why God highlights this. Remember Amalek. Remember this bad example. Don't do like Amalek did. What is he going to talk about here? Verse 18, how he met thee by the way. In other words, he came to them, by the way, while they were traveling, it seems that Amalek went out of his way to arrive where the people of Israel were. And look what happened. And smote the hindermost of thee. Who's the hindermost? Those that are in the back. When they're traveling in a convoy, those that are in the back is what he's talking about. That are the hindermost. It says, even all that were feeble behind thee. And of course, when you're traveling in a convoy, those that are feeble, or the Bible says, those that are faint and weary are going to fall back a little bit further. And these are the ones that Amalek went out of his way to target at this time. Remember, we're learning here not to be like Amalek. And look what we have Amalek doing smiting the hindmost, those that are feeble, faint, and weary, basically is saying that he took advantage of the disadvantaged, those that could not help themselves, those that were weak, those that were sickly, those that, those that needed help. And you know what? We can even draw example from the widow that was, that was there previous, right? We just, in the context of Deuteronomy chapter 25, we just learned of a widow that had nothing and was hoping that the brother would care for her and he had power to do so and he refused. And that was an abominable thing in the sight of God. And so the punishment was just in that case. Here Amalek did the same thing. He took advantage of somebody that was weak to benefit himself. He went after the hindmost. He went after the feeble, the faint and weary, taking advantage of them by his own cunning, deceptive and cowardly ways. Because when you're a, a, a manly soldier, what is more cowardly than coming in through the hind parts, going after the weakest of your enemy? That's a, that's a cunning thing. That's a deceptive thing. That's a cowardly thing to do. But here we find that the root of Amalek's problem wasn't just his deception and cowardice and, and the fact that he took advantage of people. No, 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 that was just um, a symptom of Amalek's real problem. And what was that? And he feared not God. Look at there at the end of verse 18. When thou wast faint and weary, you're attacked by Amalek. And it says, and he feared not God. That's his biggest problem. The root of the problem of Amalek here was that he did not fear God Almighty God. According to the Bible, and this is only from the book of Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is knowledge. The fear of the Lord prolongeth days. The fear of the Lord is strong confidence. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. The fear of the Lord is instruction of wisdom. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. By humility and the fear of the Lord, riches and honor and life come to a man. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life. In other words, it's always in the direction of life, whether that is eternal, whether that is spiritual, whether that is temporal, whether that is just health and, and, and marrow and strength to your bones. Life is what comes as a result of the fear of the Lord. And who doesn't need more wisdom and knowledge and length of days? Strong confidence in your life. You want these things? Do you want to be instructed in wisdom? You need the fear of the Lord. And if you have the fear of the Lord, the symptom or what comes because of having that is all of these wonderful things. And because 
Amalek did not have the fear of the Lord. Therefore, he was that deceptive and cowardly and unrighteous and ungodly person. Look how many things start with the fear of God, having a proper reverence for God, having a proper position for God in your heart and in your mind. Fear God above all things. Are you going to fear COVID if you fear the Lord? doesn't even make sense. Are you going to fear your neighbor attacking and hurting you if you fear the God? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to fear anything above Lord God Almighty that actually created and, 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 and ordained everything that is taking place right now. Not in some weird kind of uh, Calvinistic way, but what I'm saying is God created everything. So are you going to fear what's created more than the creator? That's the bottom line. Fear him above all things and let your fear of other things just drift away into the background. Having God in proper place, in proper reverence. The Bible says in Proverbs 23 and verse 17, Let not thy heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. Don't bring your heart to envy what other people have. Don't bring your heart to envy what somebody else who is a sinner, who is a man, the same as you, has the same frame as you. Don't envy what they have. Fear God. Just let Him care for you and the things that you need. Look, riches and honor and life and knowledge and length of days and strong confidence and wisdom come from fearing God above all things. And this was the problem that he did not have, Amalek, I'm saying. And that's why Amalek was condemned as wicked. God here highlights him in that same chapter. Justified as the righteous comes from fearing God, trusting Him, believing on Him, having faith in Him, and you will be justified in that same thing. Do right, live right, follow after God, pray after God, have faith in God, believe in God. Verse 19, it says, Therefore it shall be, when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about, in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt not forget it. Remember, we're talking today about justifying the righteous and condemning the wicked. How were the righteous justified here at the end of that chapter? They received of the land, they received of the inheritance to possess it, and they had the Lord thy God on their side and rest from all the enemies that would come upon them. Amalek, as the wicked, was condemned, blotted out when it came time to receive rest. Blotted out and forgotten, the Bible says, when it came time to receive possession. Blotted out and removed from the blessings of God is the lot of the wicked. You want to be justified with the righteous. How do you do so? Fear God above all things. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, strength. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Fear him above all things, and fear ye not whatsoever shall come upon you. But because you have such great faith for the one that holds your very breath in your hands. How do you become righteous? By not having unrighteousness in judgment. How do you become justified in these things? By simply having a proper standard and making everybody meet that standard. Your standard ought to be Christ. So no one's going to actually meet that standard, but at least if you're consistent in judgment, then you'll judge righteously according to the way Christ judged matters and you use the word of God essentially to, to do that in this world. How do you become justified as the righteous? By making right decisions according to the word of God and out allowing for God to lead you along in this life. And that's what we see here in the whole of this chapter is the righteous being justified, the wicked being condemned, and it's a much better thing to fall into the hands of the living God when you're being given rest, when you're being given possession and inheritance, when he's got you in the palm of his hand for good, than it is to be condemned and in the righteous judgment, the palm of his hand, when he's about to pour out wrath on you, blotting out your remembrance, making for, forgetting you when it comes time to pour out gifts and blessings and care. So, take these scriptures, learn things from them, go and look at Ruth again. It's a very interesting thing, like I said, and uh, just follow after these things and fear God, fear God, fear God above all things, and you will be counted among the righteous. Thank you, thank you, Lord, for.